side of town, but um, I actually live near uh, Science World now, not too far from there, so I just whipped over here. That is the first time I've been able to do that for a convention for a long time. The last convention I was at was in McAllen, Texas, which is on the border of Texas and Mexico on the Rio Grande. It was about 15 hours to get there, flying and driving, so 10 minutes, much more uh, enjoyable. Um, so uh, for those who don't know, who just kind of wandered in this room and have no clue who I am, I don't blame you. Most people don't know who voice actors are, but a lot of these crazy shows you watch, we get to do the dubbing uh, English voices for them. I started, uh, graduated from a theater school here in Vancouver in 1991, probably before a bunch of people in here were even born. And my first voice gig, I did film and TV and theater and stuff in the early 90s, and, and then um, uh, moved in, uh, got my first voiceover game in end of 93, maybe early 94, it was for a G.I. Joe series, which was directed by Sue Blue, who did all the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles at the time, and I just loved it. It was so fun. It was like doing theater, but it paid like film. I got to do character voices and 
wild and crazy stuff. And very shortly after that, I had these, we get these um, sides that are sent to our agents, and a side is like a short bit of dialogue, and then maybe a character description. And this character description said, um, I didn't know anything about it, I didn't know much about anime, but it was some anime show, and I'm like, what is this anime stuff? <laughs> what is this anime, anime, and you know it's anime, I'm like, oh, okay, it's, it's a Japanese animation. Oh, okay, I still didn't know much about what, I didn't even know old series that I probably watched as a kid were from Japan and dubbed. I thought they were, you know, uh, or, or that's not what they were. I thought they were probably done in America, but I had this one that I got to audition for. I didn't know anything about it, nothing. And it said, he's a diminutive, so smaller sized alien. So he's not from Earth. He's from his own planet, which is basically named after him. He's a prince as well. He's arrogant and um, evil and uh, thoughtless. And uh, in the first part of the series, he's just a cold-blooded killer. Um, and so I, I was like, wow, this guy's, this, this alien sounds intense. No picture. And his name was uh, Vegeta, uh, Vegeta. I didn't know how to say it either. And like, what's, it's not Vegeta, I'm like, it's Vegeta. I'm like, uh, or Vegeta in, in Japanese. I'm like, okay. Um, Vegeta, I didn't even know what he looked like. I thought he looked like an alien because they didn't show the pictures. <laughs> so I just wanted to make a voice that was sounded a little smaller and look more princely and um, arrogant. So I pitched my natural voice up a little higher than usual because I thought he was smaller and gave it sort of an air of arrogance. And then I wanted to sort of add a bit of evil to it. So when I saw the sides, I thought maybe he'd sound a bit like this and, and be angry and full of hate for Kakarot, that fool! And that, well, that's where I sort of placed it and that's what they chose and ended up being the, the first original English voice of Vegeta from Dragon Ball Z. Which was, and he just said this crazy line, which is insane. <laughs> that was the start of my, my uh, voiceover career in anime and then of course I, I voiced um, Zexper Keys in Gundam Wing. And uh, Alan Shazar in, uh, in Vision of Escaflown, and uh, Benny in Black Lagoon, and <laughs> Ryuk from Death Note. <laughs> also, a, a, a wonderful anime, and tons of uh, uh, Transformers anime, and Ranma characters, and lots of stuff over the years. We don't do as much anime here in town that we used to. Back in the late 90s, a lot of uh, production in that area sort of moved, as many know, to, to Texas. That's actually what happened with, with Dragon Ball Z. We had done, I don't know, 60 or 70 episodes, and all of a sudden, it stopped. we stopped doing it. And um, the producers were like, this will be easier to do cheaper in Texas. And they created um, sort of an industry down there. Actors were just, some people hadn't even done it before, and they, but they were able to, they put an ad in the paper that said, can you sound like these actors from Dragon Ball Z? And they had voice references, and those who could sound the best, like what we did, got the gigs. And they changed them, like Chris Sabbath, great friend of mine who plays Vegeta now, um, changed it to his own way, but when he first auditioned, he, he was trying to sound like I did originally, and then it got deeper into his own version, and, and now you know that uh, um, Chris's Vegeta has a different sound to it, and they all have done a phenomenal job. With, with their work on the show over the years, but a lot of that work moved to Texas, and there's a whole industry of anime that's in Texas, and um, less of it here, although we still do some, I'm working on a really cool anime right now, which I'm not allowed to say anything about um, when it comes out, but uh, everyone will know what the show is if I said it, but um, you may hear hints of Vegeta quality type sound in, in my character. Uh, but I, I, since some of that slowed down a little bit, I've done uh, thousands of episodes of everything else from Marvel characters like Wolverine and Venom and tons of roles on shows like My Little Pony and Geronimo Stilton and, and just all the traditional um, animation that happens in North America as well. Marvel characters and Lego characters, Ninjago, Star Wars, all those type of shows. Fun stuff that I've been doing for over 30 years and it's just been a blast to still be able to do it, as long as the old larynx holds out from the amount of screaming I do with characters. I do a lot of it. But uh, I'm here for you guys to answer questions about shows, the industry, and know this. If you ask me a question about a specific line in an episode I did 
27 years ago, the answer might not quite be accurate, but I'll do my best to recall what happened way back then. But uh, yeah, I'm open to any questions about anime, about the industry, about performance, about shows that you know I've worked on, and even other shows that I haven't worked on that you might want my opinion on. It might not be a great one. And, but uh, uh, I'm open to, um, to going there. Now, did you have some questions for me first, or? Yeah, so we're gonna do a couple questions up here, and then we'll open up the mic to come on up and throw questions at me. Just about anything. Awesome. Can you guys hear me? Testing, testing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. So you said that you were in the industry for about thirty years now. Yes. Yes. And I'm wondering, you know, over the years, have you kind of picked up on keywords where you know you hear this word, like for example, arrogant, and you're like, okay, I know exactly what to play. Do you have those keywords you think of, and you know, what do you what do you put into your voice from hearing those words? Well, usually it doesn't start as much with the, though that's kind of a, a word that I layer on after. What, what we'll get initially when we get a character description, I like to a visual. If they can send a picture, I'm so much happier to see a visual of a character than just a, he's this, he's this, he's this. Like a character description of Vegeta when someone says he's an alien from another planet. I'm not thinking he just looks like sort of a muscular little dude with big hair, right? I'm thinking like, you know, extra eyes, feelers, like all kinds of crazy stuff, but speaks English for some odd reason. So um, pictures always help, because then if someone's got a weird mouth or or extra fangs or a big smile, and it happened with uh, Ryuk from Death Note, um, I was asked to audition for um, for Elle's um, dad and a couple of other characters. I was not asked to audition for Ryuk, so I was sent audition sides. I showed up at Ocean Studios to do the audition, and that's where sometimes they'll put the pictures up, so they, because they don't want to send them out in emails in case people disseminate things, and it, it's, it's a problem with uh, uh, disclosing information to show before a show has actually been recorded. So I didn't see any photos, but I just knew these were normal people because it actually took place in a real world. I didn't even know there was sort of a um, a different uh, anybody else other than just real people in this series. So I had the dad prepared, and maybe I might have been reading for a couple of other roles. I might have been, been reading for Light, I can't even remember. Or probably not Light, maybe Al. Not Al's dad, Light's dad. Um, uh, with, I might have been reading for um, Al and, then, and a couple of cops. I got it. That, and then, but I showed up at the audition, and there was the pictures up, and I saw a picture of Ryuk. And I was like, whoa, who's that guy? Like, what's this guy in the show? Why didn't I get said that? So I didn't have the sides. I had nothing prepared, but I went into the audition, and uh, the director, um, I asked him, I said, I saw this picture of this other creepy-looking dude out there who looks amazing. Can I read for that guy as well? Like, what kind of sound do you want? And Carl, who directed a ton of Dragon Ball Z and other shows I've been on, said, yeah, I'm oh, sorry, yeah, I'm so, uh, sorry you didn't get that one, but yeah, you can totally read for that. All that we'd like to do is we'll play you the, the Japanese voice first, so we're not trying to match it. We don't want to match that. But there's he's kind of got a laugh, and he's and he's he's a bit more lighthearted than you might think. You might think this is a real evil dude when you first look at the picture, but that's not quite what it is. So they played a, a scene or two, and I was like, oh, and I picked up on right away just his his attitude, and of course the <laughs> the laugh and the craziness about the apples. And I auditioned for that one along with the other ones they sent me, and I ended up getting. So that was the role that I got. But I love to see a picture first, to get back to the long-winded answer to the question. I love to see a picture first. If there's no picture, I'll usually hone in on age, if they say that. How old is he? That'll really, if, it says, if he's 18 or if he's 70, that's going to change my voice. Size, he's a big guy. And then character things like jovial or arrogant or sweet or heartwarming or just vile. You know, that's when I start to layer things on find places that I've used in the past and go through the Rolodex of ideas that I had in my head. And I'll play around on the microphone for hours with stuff, just trying to come up with ideas. And sometimes I'll send in multiple takes. We don't do a lot of in-studio auditions. All these early stuff like Dragon Ball Z and, and Death Note, and all those were in-studio auditions with the director kind of uh, walking us through it. But not for, um, for uh, Gundam Wing or all these other ones. We, we did those in studios, but now we just do it all at home. We're sent the audition sides, come up with the idea of what you want to do, which does allow us to do a couple different takes though. So I'll usually have a couple ideas and say, here's take one, it's kind of my favorite, which is sort of based on their description. Take two is sort of what I think I would want to do. And sometimes I'll put a crazy take three in there that's 
probably not going to be this, but I, this would be super fun if it was this. And you'd be surprised how often a third take that just no one maybe thinks of gets picked. Because take one is usually what they, they describe. Here's what we want, blah, 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 and everybody does that. We want a Vin Diesel type of whatever, blah, 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 and everyone does that. And you, and you can imagine, you're gonna get 100 auditions. As a director, you're like, oh, here's another guy sound like Vin Diesel. Oh, here's another guy. And they all start to get repetitive. But as soon as one pops up, like, whoa, that's a different take. It stands out a bit and it makes them listen a second time and go, maybe let's not do the easy choice here. Let's do something a little more fun and original. So I'll always throw that in as, a, as an option. And I'm always happy when they choose it because <laughs> it, it's something that I came up with out of the blue and it's my favorite. Yeah. Well, speaking of your role in Death Note as yeah. a youth, yeah. uh, here's a hot, hot question, I guess. Hot question. So, what's your take on the live action movie and how they portrayed <laughs> <laughs> and how they portrayed Ryu in that, uh, you know, live action? What's your take on that? Uh, honestly, I probably would say Ryu was the best part of the live action <laughs> movie. Um, when I saw I was getting cast and they were doing a live action version, I did three live action movies at some, of, of Death Note, the Japanese one, and they actually let most of us, the cast, we dubbed them. So, uh, of course, Ryu wasn't live action because nobody looks like that. So he's a CG character that floats around beside the actual live action uh, Japanese actors. But a lot of us, Brad Swale and Alessandro Giuliani and Shannon Chan Cantus, me, so we all got to do our same roles from the anime and the live action. So I was um, uh, familiar with that, but then I knew they were going to do a one off movie. Um, when I saw they were casting Willem Dafoe, I was like, that's a good choice. I thought, if you're going to go movie star and sort of a track record, creepy voice, kind of looks a little bit like him already. I'm in there. <laughs> Not a lot of makeup. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to throw any shade, but it's, I thought that was a, like, it's a tough role to probably think of. I thought that was a good call. I'm not going to sit here and slam the movie too bad, but uh, other it's than a, that. It's a sunny day, it's a, a little shade day. is, uh... It is, uh, <laughs> it is not nearly as great as, uh, as the manga and the, and the anime series. I tell people if, uh, uh, first timers out there that haven't watched any anime, um, they'll always like, oh yes, I watched Dragon Ball Z. I'm like, whoa, it's a, dude, it's so many episodes. And let, if you like a lot of screaming and tons of fighting, and lots of people want to start there. It's so many episodes, and it goes on. And do I, should I watch Dragon Ball before Dragon Ball Z? What about Super? I'm like, it's it's a lot. I, I never start anybody there. But I will, if they're old enough, because so sometimes younger people, Death Note's pretty dark. Um, I'll say check out Death Note, because it kind of sucks you in right off the top. The very first episode, you're like, whoa, this kid has lost his mind. <laughs> right? And you're then you're like, and he's just, he's so sassy with this death god. And right off the top, like, he just, he goes there right away. And um, it's easy to get into, and it's not too long. Right? So it's, if you want to binge something, you know, over a, I don't know some people binge it in a couple of weeks, but it's, uh, you can get into it quick. And I've talked to a lot of people and said, that was how they got into sort of anime. It was, a, it was a shorter series like Death Note that you could jump right into and be really interested in and invested in the characters. But, uh, don't even know the question. That's okay. <laughs> oh, the movie, yeah. <laughs> Meh on the movie. Like, <laughs> but hey, I'm kind of excited. I put a tweet out about it that the Duffer Brothers who did Stranger Things are going to be doing a, a Death Note series as well. So yeah, I don't know if anyone saw that. They do Stranger Things and they're planning to do a Death Note series. And I was pumped because I'm a Simpsons fan. Not as much as Bones Burgers, which is kind of fun. I love the Simpsons. But um, uh, Simpsons, their Treehouse of Terror this, this Halloween, they're, um, one of their little, they usually do three little shorts kind of thing. One of them is Death Note. And they're, they're outsourcing the, um, the animation, so it's not their crew, so it's not going to be Simpsons, it's going to be very anime related. And one, so one of their Treehouse Terrors is focused, and not on like a whole bunch of anime, just Death Note. So it's uh, that'll that's that's cool. I was like, hey yeah, guys, if uh, if you need a review, <laughs> you come here. <laughs> so it's still funny to see how live that series still is, and in the minds of new creators like Duffer Brothers, who are you know putting together probably the biggest thing on Netflix that they want to do that series, and then pretty much one of the biggest anime series, the history, animation series in the history of the world, wants to choose of an anime version of their trio of terror. There's a lot of choices to make out there, and they pick that one. So it's a great show to be a part of. And I, I don't know. There's a bunch of us, for whoever's 
get some around 200 ponds, maybe we'll get to one here locally. It'd be nice, a um, uh, number of us that are gonna be doing a few cons together, myself and uh, Brad Swale, who played uh, Light, and Alessandra Giuliani, who played Al, and um, Shannon Chang Kent, who played Lisa. All four of us are probably into a few cons over the next year together. It's kind of a death note team, just we're making the rounds. As, and we are, we all are feeling good, so it's, it's a good thing. Yeah. And so one of us is like, oh no, Brad's coming. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. So you said that you know when you first got started in your career and you yep. started doing more anime roles, you barely knew what anime was. You're like anime. Can you tell us? And I, yeah. No yeah. <laughs> so now you sound like you're pretty into it. Like you've got some opinions, you've got some you know experience under your belt, binging some shows. Tell us about how you started really getting into anime from the beginning of your career to now. When I was doing it, because it still isn't as, wasn't nearly as available as it is now, I would not say I was getting into it, because this is mid-90s. Mid-90s through early 2000s was when we were recording a bunch of it. It was not easily accessible. There was no Funimation station or, or Crunchyroll. There was none of that. There was no YouTube to watch stuff. Like, you could not see it. So there was nowhere for me to really watch it except YouTube. So when I was... You know, younger because I was like mid twenties when I was doing um, started doing a lot of. I did not see a lot of. Probably what's got me more interested in some series and um, and paying attention to it more and following uh, different careers is the the other actors that I've, I've, I've worked with over the years and have had cons. So I because I meet a lot of the Funimation guys at different conventions and um, actually fans. Honestly, when you do, when you're at the autograph table and you're signing, you're always having conversations with everybody. And they say, "Have you ever watched whatever? Have you checked this one out? It's so good. I watched this, and it's awesome." And it's actually forced me to actually watch more of my own stuff um, because early on it was difficult to even watch it. Um, it just wasn't something that you could find it that easily. Dragon Ball Z, I think, was on television, YTV up here for a bit. YTV up here, yeah, it was on YTV and. Um, I had younger kids at the time, so I'm not going to be sitting down watching uh, Dragon Ball Smart when the kids are two and three. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and, it's, and it's very specific times it was on. It wasn't like there was streaming YTV, so I'll just watch it at 11 when they're in bed. It's middle of the day or 4 o'clock after school or very specific times, so I didn't watch a lot, honestly, in the early, in the, in the 90s and 2000s. Not so recently, because now, now you can just jump on Netflix or you can control it anywhere and you can just pick a show. Get into it, or there's some of them not get into it. I'm like, okay, I'm not. I'm three episodes in. I'm not. I'm not here yet. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, more more recently, and the fans. They're the ones that always are the best source of information. If you like this, you like this show. If you like that, and you don't like this, you won't like this one because it's all teenager relationships and things like that. <laughs> I'm not quite there with those ones. Yeah, I guess that yeah. after 30 years in the industry, teenage love is the first thing on your mind. Yeah, list. yeah, you know, it's, uh, there's some great ones, but they're, they're not as many that I can be um, drawn into. I, I, I love the, the, the supernatural aspect of one. I'm more of a sci-fi guy, so the ones that focus more on the supernatural, supernatural, supernatural side of things uh, get me more interested. Yeah. Awesome. Well, speaking of your love for the fans, uh, if anyone has a question, feel free to start lining up. Uh, you can come to the front and yeah. then speak your question into the mic, um, and we'll just start a lineup. Come on up, come on up. Is it on now? Yeah, yeah. It on. yeah just a little louder. Would be great. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, apologize for earlier. I am actually working remote right now <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> to be here working healthcare. So I just wanted to say you are my childhood. I remember. I was 10, I've been watching you, Yasha. I recognize your voice from my biggest love is Vision of Escaplome. You uh, have a velvety voice, and your wife is very lucky. <laughs> 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 you play like, princely roles that are very, you know, charismatic. Yeah. And even in bringing Vegeta, you know, to life, you know, his, his character is very arrogant and whatnot. Yeah. <laughs> you are pinnacle of my childhood and I just, this is appreciation mainly um, because I was really excited. I would recognize your voice. I'm a white I grew up on YTV. Yeah. YTV was the biggest thing, right? And like a kid of 
born in the 90s. Yeah. You were a gateway to anime now because it's all accessible. I would get deep. I apologize for being anyone's anime gateway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm really sad that Ocean, you know, Productions or Ocean Group is not here. Like, when I first moved to Vancouver, knowing that all my birth, like, the birth of the anime gateway was here because yeah. we didn't have access to Japanese content, right? Yeah. So, again, big appreciation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Alan Shazar. <laughs> Sorry, he's like, Alan oh Shazar. <laughs> yeah, what a sweetie. I wish I had that hair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I ended up playing a lot of guys with them. Beautiful flowing locks. <laughs> but you brought that character to life, and it's so good. And like, I, I know, you know, the Japanese kind of did you well, but you did really good dubbing of it. Like, oh, I know everyone you. gives crap for dubbing, but that was really well done. Yeah, it's uh, the, the, we, we, there's been some great work that we've done at Ocean over the years, and um, and that one was uh, that one was was stellar. And a great cast too. We just have a really fun cast, and now it was fun. It was nice after doing Dragon Ball Z. Um, because they came close after that, and sort of you're, you're you're yelling so much to end up with a character that wasn't that I could actually just speak and be in sort of princely and in my own voice and not have to force you know screaming dialogue is really hard on my throat when you're constantly yelling and now for example didn't have to do so, that that much. Thank you so much. So your question, my my question, I'm gonna end it. End yeah. It. So my question is now that with you know there's lots of accessibility with anime now when dubbing there's yeah. a lot of rap on dubbing. How do actors nowadays get paid? Is it mainly cons? Is it bookings? Do you get paid up front or do you get paid when people watch the content, like in royalties or something? It's not so much in watching most. Almost all anime, we're paid, um, we, we're part of the union of performers up here in, in BC, so any, any anime that I'm doing, it's a unionized production and we're paid per line. That's how dubbing works. And it's um, it's a relatively strong income, not nearly like prelay is where prelay is when you do all the all the, the voice work first and they animate it all after. Um, but dubbing is lesser so. In Texas, where they did a little Funimation, they moved, the pro, moved a lot of work down there because Texas is a sort of a work to rule type state where you can do um, pay anybody whatever you want. There's no union there, so it's all non union. And they started off a lot, like people getting 25, 30 bucks an hour and they just record. And it was not a great income. And most of those performers make a lot of their income at making appearances at conventions or doing autograph sales, things like that. Not myself, I do as many cons as I can and I'm fairly busy. Like I'm, it's hard to get away when you're on shows all the time because you have to be present to record them. But um, yeah, it's been it's been phenomenal. And, but most performers, that's where they'll they'll make their income at. And if you're a union performer as a performer, if it's non-union, there's not a lot of pay to do to do anime, and they will make some make up for that at conventions with appearances. Great thank you for the question. Thanks, thank thanks you for being here. All right, thank you. Fire away. Hi, so we'll keep this pretty short and sweet. Don't worry. Um, the three of us, another one over there, are soon to be graduates from On the Mic. Hey! Um, and we kind of have an idea of what to do on the commercial side. Do you have any advice when it comes to like, getting into the animation side of things? Oh, getting into the animation side. Well, that's a good question. And probably, are you guys around for the weekend? Yeah. I'll just today. Be here tomorrow. tomorrow. Okay. And you're here on weekend tomorrow. Great, because I'm doing a, there is one um, that's a panel, it's a one hour just about voice, which we'll be talking all about sort of the ins and outs of, of voice performing and being a voice performer and starting and go, moving forward. And it all will begin with um, having an agent because where most of the work is union work in Vancouver. If you're, if you're online and you, you, you put together a website and you go to some of the sites like Voices One, Two, Three, things like that, you might be able to book sort of just random stuff here and there that's kind of in, in the, the, the universe of anime that's being done, and that's not really getting anybody paid anything. But if, you, uh, if you're able to have to put together a demo, which is the important part, that's when we get you an agent. It doesn't necessarily book your roles, but it gets an agent, and the agents are the ones that see the work come in. So they see what shows up and what needs to be auditioned for. So when they say what needs to be auditioned for, um, then they can suggest you, and they'll put, they'll send the, the reach to you, you'll record them at home and send them in, and that's how you get heard. So it's really hard to get heard by local producers and shows that are being created in Vancouver without an agent. And the demo is what gets the agent. That's how it works, at least in this city and pretty much LA, sort of the bigger ones that are union-based. Non-union can be a little bit different. You still gotta kinda get your name out there, but putting together a strong demo and, and um, having an agent that might want to go into your demographic and your age group and your ethnicity, and that can be really helpful as well. And being clear on that, with, Demo is submitted. I'm this person. I'm here. I have this 
Eastern accents, these are things I do, and then you put it together in a package and hope to land a local agent to make and develop your stuff. That's the best starting point. And great school. I teach there when I have enough time. <laughs> Animation level two is for sort of people who've done uh, first and second versions of it, and then I'll pop in and do it sort of get them fine tuned. <laughs> nice question. Thank you, guys. Hey there. Hi. Uh, I'm Yeah. Uh, what was it like being cast back into Dragon Ball Super as Clone Vegeta? Yeah, that was pretty fun actually to come back to Dragon Ball Super. I, uh, Chris Adam and I are friends, so I know, I know, uh, you know Chris well, so he texts me every once in a while, we'll go and build and stuff like that. We, we, we'll chat, and he just threw me a text. Chris Adam plays Vegeta currently and, and, and took over Dragon Ball uh, uh, Z and, and Super. He sent me a text and said, There's a role coming up on Super. Can, is there any way I could get you to maybe be on the show? And I was like, eh, that'd be weird to do like some other character. You know, it'd have to be really far from our original interview. He said, well, you might be surprised what it is, but if you're interested, I'll go back to Funimation. He checked with them, said the drum was interested. Then he came back to me and told me what it was. He said, this character takes Vegeta's powers and he's a clone Vegeta, basically. And um, I want you to do it with your feet closer to the OG version of your Vegeta voice, and I'll just do it in mind. Don't try and sound like me, but like, that would be amazing. Let's do it. So I recorded from here in Vancouver. We had a, a, a Dallas engineer online, a director who directed me from Texas. I did it in Vancouver, about a four hour session. We did all the dialogue, sent it down there, and they put it into the show, and people who, who were Dragon Ball fans were like, what? You know, like, I was in Hawaii at the time on holiday when they, when they first, uh, put the little uh, teaser out for coming next on Dragon Ball Z, and there was a tiny teaser, and all of a sudden, like, Twitter was like, what <laughs> 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 is happening? Because they heard <laughs> a, a original Dragon Ball of the Dita show up in it, and it's pretty fun. Great one, a real fun thing to throw to the fans, and uh, they loved it, so it's, I, I was happy to be with all about that one. Yeah, thanks, good question. Hey, so, uh, you're obviously part of some really big series, Dragon Ball, Death Note, um, if you had a dream role or a dream character that you could voice, like if you had the opportunity, who would you say you would really want to voice as? Wow, dream roles. It's weird. It's an actor that's done, I've done so many things and got to voice some of my dream characters already. Um, for me, there's not many dream roles that I'm drawn to as opposed to people to work with. Like, uh, it's like some shows that are pre lay shows, like to have a, to be able to say you did that role on Simpsons, or you got to do that role on Bob's Burgers, or you got to be on that show when, you know, My Hero Academia, someone called you up and put you on, it, on something. That'd be, it, it, to work with people is more interesting than me than I wish I could play that guy. Because I've done so many Transformers, my favorite character growing up was Wolverine, I played Wolverine. Features. I played Venom, played Dr. Khan, Inspector Gadget. Like I'm, I've got to play so many cool ones. I have another big character coming out probably at the end of this year, which everyone will know who it is when I get to play it. And they'll either hate on me or love me for it. We'll, uh, <laughs> we'll see how that one goes. Another dream role. So I, 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 it's great when I get them, but I don't have one that I'd want to be. It's more people I'd want to work with. Like there's great people like, like Rob. Paulson and Maurice LaMarche and Eric Bowser and some of the, some of the, the big voice actors that have, that have been around for, for years that are just sort of top of their game. It's kind of like if you're in a sport, um, there's not maybe a specific sheet of ice you'd like to skate on that's like, man, if I could skate in your hockey into hockey with those guys, geez, that'd be fun. And if I could play a game with them, that'd be fun. If you play a match at a video game against somebody who you just think is your idol, that would be fun. So I'm more attracted to the to working with the people than actually a specific character. But awesome question, thank you. <laughs> hello, hello. Yes, hello. So I have a different kind of question, but I think it's really significant. Sure. So we're nearing on two years since Kirby Morrow unfortunately passed away. Yes. Could you share any of your final memories of him and how do you reflect now on the relationship with Kirby and the legacy he left behind? That's a great, great question. Kirby Morrow was this uh, phenomenal performer who I worked with from when he was just young. We were on so many, uh, so many shows together. And Kirby, of course, for the White Bee version, took over as Goku on, on Dragon Ball Z. Um, so a lot of people would have seen uh, Kirby and I worked together for years on that series. 
and Wooten. They joggle together and other, other anime series together. Um, piles of stuff. Uh, when I look back, I, I feel like uh, as, as much as you think you, you know someone and are connected with someone, you wish you maybe would have connected more. Right? That much more. He was always the the, the light of when, when he'd show up, he was he'd always have a smile on his face and he'd be like, hey, Mark, how's it going, man? Like he was just that kind of energy all the time, wherever he was. And um, to, 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 it was even hard for us as performers to understand when he passed away. To, to, it's still hard to think that I'm not going to show up at a show that he would be on because he was on so many. It's like, oh, hey, Kirby, I need to see people. So, Never take anybody who's a friend or you think might be in a great place or or, or some for granted. Just don't take it for granted is what I would say. And I, I sort of feel like that's, I wish I would have even just gone for a beer with him more often or had a coffee with him just a few more times or, or got to know him even that much better. And uh, and uh, maybe things would have would have gone differently. Uh, so it's a good question. Just, and, and um, you know, the rest of peace to Kirby Moore, who was, and he did some Incredible anime and, and, and uh, passionate, passionate uh, voice actor and real good friend to so many people in the city. Thanks for everything. Thank you very much. Hello. Hello. Uh, I'm so just going to take a different kind of question. Okay. Can I request please your line from Ben Murray? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, it's not Vegeta, though. No. Uh, it's not Vegeta. Do you remember voicing Vegeta? Voicing oh. Vegito. Yes. Oh, Vegito. Yes. So you, I think you tried to sound like Goku. Yeah, so Kirby, that's funny, we we're just talking about Kirby would have uh, been voicing Vegeta, I mean Goku at that time, and I was voicing Vegeta. And the director, sometimes they'll just have, uh, in the past, certainly in the American version, they would take the two voice actors and do their parts and put them together. And Carl, I think, might have been directing that when our director at Ocean has done a lot of stuff. He, I, can, I just recall, I didn't really know what was up with the with the uh, connection in that scenario. He wanted us to, me to sort of try and sound a little bit more like Kirby, who's just, he's more of a dude, right? And Goku is a bit of a bro, and he's, he's, he's kind of that way, and add them together. And I honestly can't remember what I did, what, what, what I did for him besides have a little bit of sort of the, that Goku sound, the Vegeta, the same way, and I don't even know what I did and how they, how they made it sound. People say you sounded like Sonic. I sounded like Sonic. Well, that's probably, be, that, that's probably because I was probably, to take the arrogance and the um, um, uh, uh, sort of evil aspect of it out of Vegeta, and then make him a little bit more cool, it's gonna slide into that, well, I don't know guys, but it's gonna have that sort of sound that's just a little more cool. And that's probably where it can head towards Sonic. But honestly, I don't know if I can remember. You, you, someone have to pull it up for me to tell me what it sounded like. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's that's where it was, but I don't know if I can remember a specific piece of dialogue to think about. It, but that's my question. <laughs> Good question. All right, fire away. Hello. Yeah. Um, before I start asking a question, I just have a side question. Sure. How do you pronounce your last name? Drummond. Okay, I think that that's French. Right <laughs> <laughs> no, even uh, the people like, what's the like, Drummond, and then is it French? Yes, or? he pronounces Drummond, and I was told that that's not how it's pronounced. No, it is. It's a Scottish name, uh, Drummond, that's how you say it. I shall yes. thank you, because he owes me dinner now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. My personal question is this, but first, it's actually a thank you and uh, for voicing one of my childhood TV series, and I don't know if you'll probably recall it, but um, and it's a very awkward question, but I want to say thank you for actually voicing some of the characters from an old series called The Busy World of Richard Scary. What's it called? The Busy World of Richard Scary. Oh, yes. I can't even remember which characters I did in it. That's, uh, well, okay, well, there was my question. <laughs> I was actually going to ask, um, because I know a lot of the characters that you voice nowadays, they're like, really like top-notch or really very well-known characters. Yeah. Like Vegeta, of course, yeah. and Wolverine. But I was wondering, when you were voicing the characters for the 
or you did you well to steer with it? Yeah. What was your thoughts on the matter? How did you approach it? Just because the genre between what you do now for a lot of movies and that back then it was a, it was a um, childhood. Piece. Yeah. Like, well, surprisingly, in Vancouver there is a <laughs> lot of uh, primary and preschool animation that's done. I probably do a lot more of that mm -hmm. than you. Because I've known for some of these big bad guys and villains and stuff. There's a lot of preschool shows, like uh, and um, and younger audience shows, um, like uh, Rainbow Ruby and, uh, uh, and 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 younger sounding natural characters like My Little Pony and Geronimo Stilton. There are tons of shows I do that are actually. Or I'm just Martha Speaks was a big one on PBS. Mm -hmm. Wrote this play, the dad or uh, family friends or. Um, Characters that are, uh, you know, even the, there was one called um, Nerds and Monsters, which uh, I played uh, some fun characters on. This for definitely for a younger audience, but I've been able, lucky enough to do shows in all genres since I've been here, and I, I find those just as much fun. You have to give yourself a little bit different mind space when you're doing shows because you 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 know it for younger audiences because you have to focus a little bit more on the words. And then slowing things down a little bit more because a lot of it is about learning, a lot is about the words, and not and sometimes it's really being clear with the stories, and not as much about um, destroying Goku and sending him to hell. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to say that um, thank you for it because it was definitely a series that helped me during my childhood, and I grew up with it. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for being part of it. Thanks so much. Hey there, how are you? Good and you? Sorry, we have like we have 20 minutes and almost got We can do it. No problem. We got it. Yeah. For any other Dragon Ball pro projects going on in the future, how would you feel if you got the call to come back and do these projects? It would be fine. You know, honestly, if there was something they wanted to call me up for, I'm in a place in uh, with all the other shows that I'm working on, you know, whenever you're, you're a performer and the phone rings and, and someone says, we got a gig for you, you're like, yeah, <laughs> you, know, you get excited because it's a gig, right? But um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited. It's, it's a great franchise, but I'm also aware it's in the hands of others right now and moving into different places and Super's doing, doing phenomenal, the movie is, is, is out. I'm, I'm not part of those things right now, but if Chris or anybody call us up, of course, we'd be open to being uh, a part of uh, such a, a legendary um, franchise as that. It's kind of like someone says, yeah, someone from Marvel phoned up and wanted you to be, yeah, you want to be involved because they're just great franchises and I'd be totally open to it. I'd probably want to discuss what the character is and maybe how to create a voice that steers clear of stuff I've done in the past a little bit, unless they want it to sound exactly like someone I've done in the past, but it, it, it'd be a, an honor to work on any of those shows again. It's, they're, they're really fun. And always a great group of people that are, that are, that are producing them. That's amazing. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so much for shaping my childhood. One of the most <laughs> iconic characters of all time. I hope I, I, hope I shaped it well, though. Shaped in a positive way? <laughs> uh, probably in an evil way. Oh, okay. <laughs> sorry, mom and dad, for what I've done. <laughs> oh, no, there are big girls. I know, there's a lot, but love the villain, Betty. You, you can't believe how many conventions I go to that are like, yeah, but you can't. <laughs> a lot of go fans out there, though, too. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Hey man. Hello. How are you? Good, how are you? Yeah, excellent. Nice. Um, so, earlier we were talking about how you kind of had your opinions on certain Death Note projects, like outside the anime. Yeah. Um, what's your thoughts on, like, have you been up with, like, any Dragon Ball stuff? And what's your thoughts on it? Like, any of the movies, live action, anime, games? Yeah. Um, yeah, thoughts on, uh, I mean, I haven't seen, there's a lot of Dragon Ball. I haven't seen yeah, all the Super and all the movies. I've seen lots of pieces and some episodes. Um, yeah, I. it's not where I spend most of my time just watching anime because there's so much of it. And also there's so many prelay shows that I do. I'm actually just now, uh, I'm only about five episodes in, but I'm re-watching Death Note again. <laughs> I just went back and said, but I gotta get this back in my head because I might be up to conventions and people bring up certain Parts of it, I'm like, I need a refresher. <laughs> it's been a while since I've seen it all, and a long time since we've done it, so it's not fresh. So I'll refresh myself with shows every once in a while. To be honest, probably where I, I'll get a lot of content is just online watching clips and updates and talking to fans 
and then just uh, once in a while I'll, I'll, I'll hone in on a certain series that I love. I've watched anything Studio Ghibli. I've seen all those movies yeah. so many times because <laughs> they just they're just so phenomenal, right? Yeah. And I'm really big fan of the Ghibli films and <laughs> watch them all with my kids. I'll watch them by myself and. Princess Mononoke is amazing. It's yeah. such a great film. The cat bus, my favorite bus ever. If I could only ever ride one. <laughs> but but um, uh, yeah, I, uh, I'm a fan of the genre. I'm not nearly as deeply in invested in as many series as you guys clearly are. But uh, whatever time I do have, I try to keep tuned up just to be aware of the new things that are happening. And it is prolific, the amount that, of content in anime that there is out there right now compared to when I was your ages, it's just, mm -hmm. there's, it's almost overwhelming to know even where to start. Mm -hmm. So that's why I tell people, start with Tenpo. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, yeah. Thanks so much for your Awesome, thank you. Away. 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 What advice would you give to someone who's like casually interested in the idea of getting into voice acting, for example, like, I'm just a dude in college studying yeah. arts in Norwegian, like obviously not like theater or acting, what, what advice would you give? Good question. Um, well, anything that's gonna, because what I'll usually say is, do you want success in it? Do you, like, do you want success as a performer? Do you want to make money doing it? Um, if you want to have success and be paid doing it, it can't be casual. Um, that's the main part. You won't be able to sort of, well, if I just kind of throw myself out there, am I going to get wealthy? No. Right? There's so many people that, you know, put time and effort and so much uh, work into creating characters and creating performances. Um, they're going to be the ones that, that land the gigs compared to uh, uh, just sort of a, a side thing. But what is available out there, which is great right now, is the ability to create so much of your own content and do your own stuff and actually casually do it for fun. Like, I might not want to be a professional golfer, but um, if I'm gonna casually do it, um, there's lots of opportunity to, for me to really have fun doing it. But if you wanna make money at it, and if someone told me, well, I mean, how, what do I do if I kind of like golfing, and but I also kind of wanna make money doing it? Okay, <laughs> you better really, you gotta get really good to make money doing it. And that's kind of the same way for, for voiceover. You have to get to a level where you're really committing time and effort to it. And some of that will be learning performance, and learn, because acting is the first part of voice acting, not just the voice, you got a great voice by the way, it's got great tone to it. Um, and, but you can have a great voice, but not know how to take someone else's dialogue off a page and bring it to life, right? That's, what, that, that's what's very different. Um, you might be able to mimic lines you've heard in series and do a perfect impersonation of you know, this character and a person, perfect impersonation of this scene, but that's already been done. They want your version of this new character, or your version of what that guy would sound like, or your version of what Wolverine would be like if he was you, or what um, so-and-so would be like if they were you. And that takes training, just like anything else. And any opportunity to do, take a, an acting class, take a um, uh, improv class, or on the mic training. We saw some of the folks here at On The Mic is a great training uh, facility in Vancouver, which is all about voiceover. They have specific stuff about dubbing, specific about traditional animation, radio spots, that, that type of stuff. And um, you can learn a, a ton here. And it takes some finances to learn how to do it, but there's also a lot you can do online for next to nothing. And you can learn how to do um, accents and voices and characters and to sort of get yourself some confidence for free before you maybe even take a course like that. That says, because by the time you get to a course like that, you're starting to think, I really want to do some of this for like work, like for my life. And, and then you'll invest it if that's what you want to do. But it's investment of time and effort um, to get there. I did um, three years of, I know we're doing as much as I can. I did three years of theater school, which was six days a week, 14 hours a day before I even was booking that some theater gigs when I got out and film and TV and then voiceover and I worked for three years, four years in the industry doing film, TV and voice and radio spots before I booked my first voice gig. So, and before theater school, I was doing um, a year and a half of amateur theater in the, in the town I came from. So I did three or four shows of amateur theater, auditioned for a theater school, which I got into three years of that, six semesters of 14 hours a day, and then work, work, work when you get out. That's put me in a position to have enough skill set to probably even um, do some of those auditions. But 
Some people can get there a lot faster than that with great voice, great tra some great training and a great facility and a good demo reel that a, that a, a, a casting director or a, 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 an agent will say, I like what you've got and take you on. Some people can jump into it a year later if they want to. So there's options, but it does take work. All right, thank nice you. Meeting. Fire away. So, uh, speaking of casual voice acting, um, yeah. I do voice acting for my D and D group. I've done it for about four years or so now, cool. and I do a lot of different rough voices and whatnot. So, I've got a very quick question. Yes. How do you take care and preserve your voice during scenes that are rougher on your throat? Like, let's say, longer screams, or like if you're doing like a chain smoker impression, almost like I have to do. Yeah. I have to do for four years. <laughs> it's really difficult question. How to take care of your voice when you're screaming? It's hard. I lost my voice. Completely for a couple of days during Dragon Ball Z. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. the first time I lost it because, and, and, and I, uh, fluids is um, the best thing. You've got to hydrate and rest. Yeah, Those yeah. are the two main ones. There's no thing you can pour over it or, or just make it better. There is some training, Some there is actually some voice trainers that are out there now doing what's called sort of um, almost fight technique training, but for your voice because so, there's so much of it in video games and so much of it in anime, to learn how to scream and yell for extensive periods of time without trashing your voice, yeah, but yeah. I still find it difficult. Yeah, because the main thing that heals me, and I have um, a series that I'm on that I knew was gonna require a bunch of screaming and fighting, and I told the agent, you can only book me on Fridays for this show, because I need the weekend to heal. Yes, Before I'm on yes. shows next week, it's, I'm not doing this in the middle of the week, because it will ruin what I have on Thursday and Friday, I won't be able to do it. So book me on Friday, and I'll, I'll be able to rest it over the weekend, have fluids, take care of it. Nim John, that's a great, um, sort of almost like a cough syrup type stuff that you can get a lot, uh -huh. a lot of the uh, uh, health food stores. Yeah. That's um, a great uh, Asian kind of remedy. That's really one if you're in the middle of a session and you want to take something, you don't have time to rest it or to have too much yeah, fluid. Yeah. That's, a, that's a great one. Yeah, but rest and fluid and hydrate yes. are your best things to try and take care, and not too much of it in a row. Yeah, yeah. And know when it's like, this is hurting, to stop. It's kind of like when you're in the gym, if you're doing something and lifting too many weights, it's like, I'm hurting now, well, you gotta stop when it hurts, okay. then you'll just get, do more damage. But, uh, yeah, that makes sense. I've definitely yeah. gone hoarse myself in lost Yeah, time. you can see the losing. I'll, I'll lose it. I mean, I'm, just, if I go, I, I'm a hockey fan, I'll go to a hockey game here, and I'll be screaming, and I'm like, and then I know I have to work the next day, and I have to like, <laughs> keep my mouth yeah, shut, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. little foam finger, and I'm like, that guy's not a very intuitive fan. I'm like, <laughs> 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 I'm like <laughs> scream or bowl, so can't say anything. Yeah, yeah. I'll protect my voice. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much, and I'll see you for the panel on Sunday. All right, cool. Fire away. Cool. I also went to over the bike training. Great. And my teacher was Michael Adamfly. Yeah. Who was the voice for Ray Cumber, so yeah. on Death Note. So yeah. just going through my. Death Note, voiceover. Yeah. Good with Michael for years too, Ninjago, lots of stuff. He's great. Uh, my question is, as you know, for the last couple of years, a lot of the professions have incorporated remote work, work from home uh, yeah. into their work. Voice acting talents also set up their own booths. Uh, they read the script, send it over to the engineers, to the directors, and collaborate that way. Yeah. And my question is, do you have any experience with that? What's your experience been like? And number two, do you think it's a sustainable way for this industry to, to continue that way and work remote? Um, yeah, I haven't been, we haven't doing, through COVID, any of our work remote, the, the auditioning has been uh, remote, but we've still been going into the studio to do ours. We just, instead of being able to working all, work all together, we, were, we ended up in a, in a scenario with voiceover is uh, kind of almost the perfect industry to still have survived through COVID because you work in an isolation booth. Right, you're by yourself with double pane glass and doors and no one else in there. So you can actually do it. What they just did between performers was they'd have special um, uh, filters in there that would run you know, nonstop to filter the space. They'd have 15 minute gaps between the next performers. They would change out the headphones, change out the pop guards and mic things, and then the next performer would be allowed in. Once the air was circulated, they'd change everything out one at a time. Whereas a lot of shows we would all work together in a group. Dubbing is always one at a time, so it's kind of easy for them to just do it. And the, the directors would stop coming in, they just zoomed in, so it was only me and an engineer on the other side of the glass. They even created things like these mic stands that are that are electric, so that instead of, usually they'd come in and adjust your mic to your where your, where your mouth was, they have uh, uh, electric um, remote ones that they could, from the, from the engineering booth, just go and move it to where your mouth was from the other side, not even have to be in the room with you. So that change happened pretty quick with COVID and we were able to do it, do our sessions all in studio. So I didn't do any sessions, only a couple, 
from home that might have been based out of Toronto or LA or something. But all the Vancouver sessions we actually did in studio. Auditions, yeah, you do do from home. And I don't see that changing anytime soon. It's saving them a ton of money not having to book studios for auditions. I'm not as much of a fan of it because you don't get direction. You don't get to sort of play around and, and hear the notes from the creators of the show that can push you in certain directions. You just gotta come up with it all yourself. And then you kind of throw it out there and hope they like it. It's like a fart in the wind. You don't know if it's, if it's like, where'd it go? You never give any notes. You don't hear back from them. It's kind of like, <laughs> and, did you like what I did? And they don't say anything, right? You, 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 it's really hard to have no feedback. I know it's really difficult for the on-camera performers because they're doing so many auditions at home instead of in, in an audition studio where a director can go, yeah, let's do it like this, and let's do it like that. And on-camera is difficult because they, um, they can judge you as soon as they see you. So they can be looking at 100 auditions of, of on-camera performers and go, the moment you show up, ah, that person's too old. Uh, no, I don't like you. Uh, and you haven't even done the audition yet. Right. Where the audition might be great, but they've judged you, but when you're in studio, they can't say, no, get out, when you walk through the door. They, you'd still get to do the audition, which might be epic. Right. And then I go, oh, I would judge them when they came in if they weren't even right, but their audition was incredible. Sometimes that's, you don't know if they're even watching everything you do when you do on camera stuff. Even with voiceover. That's why with voiceover, when I say, when you're sending an audition in, make those first 10 seconds great. I even just play around with how I, I do my, 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 my slate, which is where you say your name and character off the top, I'll do it in voice in the character. It's like, something like that's Brian Chuck reading, you know, monster number seven, right? And I'll throw it out there like that. And then so they, so right away, they don't hear what I really sound like. Or if I'm doing Santa Claus, I don't want to be like, hi, it's Brian Drummond here, and I'll be reading Santa Claus. And then go, oh, oh Merry Christmas. I start sounding like an old guy doing Santa Claus. So they think that's what they're getting. But make that first part pretty interesting right off the top, and then you have a better chance of probably getting in the room when the time they might not have time to listen to everybody. They get 500 auditions, can you imagine? Trying to listen to all of it, and I'm like that too. When people send me stuff to review, uh, I'll, uh, when I, people send me things to review, I don't, um, I can't listen to it all. I'll listen to the first bit, and I'll, yeah, it's gotta be stronger at the top, I won't listen to it all, if it's not sort of epic, anyway. Okay, thank you very much. Fire away, we're well, gonna be a rapid fire for our next ones here. All right, um, speaking of OTM, I'm actually going for the full time in this fall. Nice. Um, so what I wanted to ask was, any advice for the full-time program, or just how to approach it? I don't teach in the full-time program, but what you want to do, if you want to be a voice actor, um, one of the best things to is try, as best you can, as hard, is throw away your fears. You have a voice that no one else has, nobody sounds like you. you. You only sound like you, right? So if you only sound like you, what you want to do is throw your full self into everything you do. Make a fool of yourself, be ridiculous, come up with crazy ideas, don't be embarrassed, like, we do the most, we're in this ridiculous industry. We do crazy stuff. Someone will say, okay, Brian, yeah, oh yeah, we have this squirrel in this scene, and he kind of gets a rock thrown at him and gets hit and falls down on a tree. Be a squirrel that falls out of a tree. Uh, uh, you know, you don't really come up with a, come up with what he sounds like. Come up with a, what, he, with what he's gonna be, and be silly and be crazy. And uh, listen to your, uh, clearly to your directors, and, um, and listen to all you, your peers in the classroom and just be open to learning anything because when you're fresh, you can learn so much. Thank right? you. Good luck, that's a great program. Hello. Hi, it's so nice to be here. I just want to say, Brian, I've been a big fan of you and everyone else at Ocean my whole life. Uh, thank you. I've watched I can tell by the outfit. <laughs> yes, I dressed up as Zach's sister knowing Zach would be here. Yes. Yeah, I love your performance of Zach Marquis. And I did actually snicker when you said you're not letting your kids watch Dragon Ball till they're older, because I got into Dragon Ball Z when I was like two or three. Oh, wow. wow. And first saw Gundam Wing when I was four. Wow. Yeah. Now I feel really old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when you see grown up people saying, I saw Gundam Wing when I was four, I'm like, <laughs> what happened? Where did all the time go? Oh, Look at yeah. that character. Two days ago. <laughs> Definitely. That and Inuyasha have been my two most favorites out of everything that was in those. And I just find it so impressive how you can switch between voicing a young man and a grumpy old dude, because you're also one of the scientists that worked on the Gundams, if I'm correct. Yeah. Professor G. Yeah, that's, yes, absolutely. You make that switch so quickly. Well, we get to do our lines, at least in, in dubbing, separately. So we do, we do them one at a time. So what will happen is to try and stay in voice 
Um, if you're doing multiple characters on a show, they'll say, okay, Brian, do all of um, Zach's lines now. So, you, so I stay within that. Then we'll go back to the beginning of the scripts. Now we're gonna do this character. And then I can switch the voice. Sometimes, if there's not much, I'll just go back and forth on a show. And, and, and if, if I don't feel there's a big issue, but sometimes when you go back and forth, one voice can bleed into the other one a little bit. And I've always had sort of texture in my voice. So it's never, it's never been hard to sort of find a way to, to sound older in that age. <laughs> and then take it away if I just don't sort of fall into the texture. I can let it sit a little bit higher. And then add something good and take a few teeth away and make it sound older. Just the part where you're like, <laughs> I'm, yeah. And the part where you snarled at your own name in Emma's wall. <laughs> you have got to show us a Zach snarl sometimes. <laughs> Amazing. Well, thank you so much for, for coming. I hope we get to chat more at our other cons. And come say hi Eat at, the, at the autograph tables. I'm, I'm open to chat people to come by as well. Why are we? Hi there. Um, so, I won't talk about this one just because I know there's a panel on Sunday. Uh, that being said, though, voice actor, yeah. um, really climbing the ropes right now. Question, where do I go in Vancouver to be a damn good voice, not voice actor, actor? Actor, yeah. oh wow, there are a lot of uh, great programs. Um, I went to Studio 58 and auditioned for the program there. It's a theater training program and I, uh, that's where I went. It's based on Langara College, so it's not actually super expensive, but it can be tricky to get into. It's not take anybody, they'll audition Two, three hundred people across the country every semester and take in 16. So it's uh, they start with 16 per term and you kind of get past the, the lines of tr trying to get in. So uh, Simon Fraser's got a great theater program, UBC's got a great theater program, Vancouver Film School, probably more accessible as far as not as difficult to be in a lineup of auditions to get into. And um, and on the mic it does some, some standard uh, acting uh, program work as well. Um, so there's there's a lot of options uh, out there, but some harder to get into than others because they don't just you don't just say sign up and get in. You have to audition for the program and make it past sort of that rigorous part of it. Thank you. Yeah, great question. Fire away. What we got time for a couple more? Oh, Dex on the phone. Bye, mom. <laughs> no worries. What's your question? Uh, which character do you like to voice better? Iron Man, uh, Marvel Superhero Adventures, or Jumpy Ghost Boys Home Hero One Piece? Oh, Iron Man, Jumpy Ghost. Why? You know what? Jumpy Ghost Face was bizarre and hilarious at the same time. I'd probably say because that show was so insane and so interesting, I would say that one was more interesting to me. Um, it was fun to do Iron Man for a few episodes of, yeah. of, of that. Of the Marvel Superhero Adventures was one of my best shows. Yeah. I like the Marvel, so my favorite character was Vince Marvel. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I was working with a parody movie of Chip and Dale. Oh, yeah. Who knows? I was thinking Iron Man should play a role as a director, so. <laughs> yeah. He could have. He could have. Well, thank you. Awesome. Thanks a lot for your question. We'll get one more and um, let everybody get on to the rest of the con. So, hi. Quick, quick question. So, what do, what do you feel like the greatest perks of the, your career? Like, thinking you're when. You, Stop said, make you think yourself, I love my job. Here, here, I might have to you take your mask off. It was a little mumble that I couldn't hear. Okay, so what is the greatest, what do you feel like the greatest perk of your job? Like one that makes you say, think yourself, I love my job. Uh, the greatest perk, that's a good question. The greatest perk that says, I love my job. It's probably, uh, it's a couple of things. The people in voiceover are amazing. I don't know, there's, there's a, there, I, I want to be generalized with film or with theater, not so much as theater, but film, there can be a lot more hierarchy of, you know, whether you're a background performer or a day player or the movie star, like there's a lot of hierarchy about, don't talk to them, you can talk to them, like it just feels like you could be a peon or you're a star, and if you're a star, you can't have a life. You can't really go anywhere and do things. In voiceover, there's people that have done some of the biggest shows and done crazy characters and done some of the most amazing stuff that are just as generous to the first, the person who has the first gig with two lines on one show, and they're in an episode with you. 
they're, it's just really inviting and, um, and uh, we're, we, we all feel like equals in, in the voiceover business. When I meet the newest person to someone who's been at it for 30 years, no one, there's not a lot of attitude and a lot, a lot of ego. There's the odd person that might have some ego, but it is rare. I could probably count on my hand, even being at conventions where it's like, whoa, that person has seriously got like ego about being a voice performer. And to me, I'm like, come on, you're a voice of a cartoon. You do cartoons for a living, like, let's take it down a notch. So I, I love that people are really laid back and there's not a lot of ego. That's a perk. It's a perk. Anonymity is kind of a perk when you can do as many voices and crazy characters. I can play all these huge roles, but still go to the grocery store and nobody comes up to you and says, she aren't you, she's just from Chester Falls. When you're at the car, it happens all the time, but not out and about in your everyday life. You don't get, um, unless you sound a lot like your character. I have a great friend, Vincent Tong here, who plays um, one of the leads on Ninjago. He was on a, a Disneyland ride, just talking with his buddy, and one of the kids was across a seat, and I think they were on Grizzly River Run, which is kind of, you sit in a boat with eight people and go down these rapids. And he plays, um, he plays Kai on uh, Ninjago. And uh, he just talked with his friend, and there was a girl, maybe a, a teenage girl, that was sitting across, so was kind of awkwardly starting to look around, and then looked at him and was like, you sound so much like God from Ninjago. And he's like, oh my God, I've never had this voice been recognized before. And he's like, I am Kai in, in Ninjago. And she's like, ah! And of course, she stuck on the ride with him for the whole time. So she, was, she was so excited that, that, but he was pumped like, I felt like a movie star. Someone recognized my voice in the lineup, right? But most times, if someone asks you to do the voice, <laughs> it's pretty funny. You can match. There's so many people who can match voices and do a good version of something. You might be at a convention and a little kid's like, "No, oh, you were like, you're like you. Can you do his voice then?" And you do it. And they're like, "Yeah, I guess it kind of sounds like." That. <laughs> wow. They're like, you know, they just don't buy it. Right? <laughs> so many people can can make up voices, but. That's a perk, anonymity, the great people in it. And um, uh, it's for me, it, it, it pays pretty great too, I love it. <laughs> and you know what? Actually, I'm gonna put it at the top of the list. Animation fans are the best fans. There's sci-fi people out there, and there's like Supernatural, and there's Robin Wars, and, but the anime fans are crazy epic. They're probably the best part of the, the, the industry. And then the people, Good question. Thanks so much. So we yeah, ran over on, on everybody. That went okay. It was a really great panel. There were so many really great questions. Thank you. So I think it was it was uh, well deserved. I think it was good. Thank you. And I will be downstairs. I think from like one till three in the autograph area. Um, and don't worry about having to buy autograph stuff. You can if you want. I'll be, I'll be signing throughout the weekend on different times. But you can also come by and uh, say hi. Try and catch a time if there's not like a pile of people down there. It's always harder to have a good conversation with someone if um, if I don't have much time. But, but yeah, if there's a lineup, it's hard. But if there isn't, and you see me just kind of sitting there looking at my phone, come over, say hi, <laughs> ask questions, and uh, we'll shoot the shiz. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great to meet um, all of you. I hope to see everyone around for the rest of the weekend. Sorry, we still gotta do all these crazy masks, but um, mm -hmm. for photos and stuff, I'll pull it down. Thanks again, everybody. Bye.